and our moderator, Mary Harris of WNYC. Mary is the host and managing editor of Only Human, a show that covers health in ways that everyone can relate to. She spent years focused on health reporting at ABC Hi, News, hey, how are you? Where, we, where we worked a couple doors down. Um, she's a thoughtful and dedicated journalist, and we're so glad she's here with us today. Personally, as a journalist, Mary and Dr. LaPook are people I look up to tremendously, and I'm so, so happy they're with us for this conversation. Mary? Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, Laura, for that introduction. Um, as Laura said, I'm the host of a podcast called Only Human at WNYC. It's part of a larger effort at WNYC to do more health journalism, uh, especially in New York City, where so much um, is already done in terms of public health. Um, we wanted to really bring that out, and so we founded a health unit a couple years ago, um, and when we started a podcast, I became the host. So we like to say that everybody has a story uh, at our show, and I think that's so important when we talk about these issues of health communication. And the reason why is that it gets so sticky when you talk about health. There are so many granular details that you can get wrong. We sort of got into that a little bit in the last panel. Um, things are constantly changing. You're constantly deciding and then re-deciding what the right advice is. But everybody has a story. Everybody has a body. It's so important that we get these issues right and we communicate these subtle details to people. Um, so that's our job. And uh, I'm really happy we can tell you a little bit more about it. I'm going to introduce you, these guys. Um, the panel is how can cities prepare for the next public health crisis. We're probably going to range a little bit beyond that. I hope you're patient with us. Um, but let me introduce these guys. So um, Jay Varma is the Deputy Commissioner for Disease and Control at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. That means if there is an outbreak of anything, legionnaires, <laughs> uh, if there's someone uh, with Ebola, you are going to hear a lot from Dr. Varma which you probably all know. Um, sitting next to him is um, John LaPook, who is the chief medical correspondent for CBS News, also a physician at NYU Langone, which um, my first episode was about my own sort of medical crisis. I got cared for at NYU Langone, great hospital, so happy to have you. Um, Todd Ringler at the end, I have known for more than two decades. Uh, he has been in this business long enough that he remembers when I was a 21-year-old just starting uh, to understand what healthcare journalism was all about. So I'm really thrilled that we're here. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is I want to look at Zika a little bit as a case study, especially in New York City, because back in August, I heard Dr. Bassett speak. Uh, she was really wonderful, and um, I felt sort of, <coughs> <laughs> I guess for me, she said 25% of the cases in the United States of Zika are in New York City, and I was surprised by that number. But then I, I said, of course, I shouldn't be surprised by that number. We have so many people here from other countries traveling back and forth. This really is one of the places you're going to see um, diseases become global. There's a reason why the first Ebola case was here. Well, not the first. Oh, I'm sorry. The, but the one that we all got so concerned about. Um, so I want to start with Dr. Varma and talk a little bit about what do we misunderstand about this disease? What are we getting wrong when we communicate this stuff? I mean, I think probably the biggest challenge that we face throughout is um, uncertainty. And as we heard from the first panel, um, you know, we need to be better in public health about communicating on our uncertainty. But that becomes you know, very challenging. Uh, when uh, this outbreak was first recognized to be spreading rapidly throughout Latin America. You know, we knew in New York City it was only time until we had imported cases here. Um, but the challenge was there was still a lot of uncertainty about what was the potential risk of local transmission. Um, and so I think really that challenge, I think, was very hard to, to make sure that everybody in the media understood that. Um, I think over time it became clearer. Um, but again, in, in public health, we, we often take the most sort of conservative approach. We'd rather over-prepare or over-respond and be able to say later, oh, isn't it good that we did that? Or, you know, thank goodness this didn't happen. So I think in, in, in Zika, this was a real challenge. And I, and I think one of the areas that we made a mistake in mm -hmm. um, is that, you know, very early on, you know, we were so concerned about there being awareness about um, the threat of local transmission, that we spent a lot of our public communication time talking about how we were going to enhance our vector control here in New York City. Mm -hmm. We were very worried about that level of uncertainty and, the, and the, the concerns that it could generate if there is local transmission and we didn't prepare enough. When in fact, 
the risk, we knew ahead of time, the biggest risk was going to be imported cases. Hmm. And the message needed to be delivered to people who have friends and relatives there that if you are a woman of reproductive age and you are not on durable birth control, uh, hmm. you need to avoid traveling there. And, and we, we have been delivering that message now, but that wasn't the first message we focused on. And I think that's one of the challenges that we faced is trying to measure, well, what is the what is people's concern, which is about mosquitoes here, versus what's the actual risk, which is travel. So have you rolled that back? Like, are you, are you, is there less larvicide, less? Well, no, we're still doing everything related yeah. to, to vector control, and I, and I think that was actually the right decision. The challenge here is about communication. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, the, the justification internally and why I chose to, to take that approach and advocated to our commission that we do it was because we were very concerned about what, you know, what are the consequences to public health? You know, what we rely on is credibility. You know, the reason we're successful is because people trust us. Um, and as soon as they lose that trust, then, then we can't do anything. So where's the, where's, the, where's the danger to our credibility? The danger would be if there was local transmission and we didn't do enough to prevent it from potentially happening. So we had to take those activities. The challenge is this segmentation of your audience where we want to get sure, we want to make sure that people don't oppose the enhanced mosquito control activities. So we need to prepare them. We also need to give them some sense of control that they actually have an action they can do, such as using mosquito repellent, cleaning out standing water, using you know, screens on their windows. But at the same time, the real risk, the risk that you mm -hmm. talk about, these 20, 25 percent of the United States cases, are because we have a very close connection to the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. And, uh, and so it's, it was inevitable that we, just like with Ebola, just like any other infectious disease that occurs outside our borders, it's going to come to New York. You know, someone raised the question um, a little while back about how do you communicate to people who don't necessarily want to be communicated with. Mm -hmm. um, how did you address that challenge with Zika? You know, we, New York is, is great because we have so many media outlets. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really, the, just the density of information people can get to. I think we can get the information out there. But again, the challenge is um, who gets that information, who acts on it. And very early on, we noted that all of the testing that was being done of uh, people uh, who are at risk of Zika, primarily we were worried about reproductive age women, was being done in wealthier neighborhoods of New York City. This was not high rates of testing in uh, Washington Heights or parts of central Brooklyn where you have large Caribbean and Latin American communities. And that's because the message just wasn't getting to them. And as uh, we heard before from Dr. Gerberding, the message wasn't getting to those providers who needed to be the ones taking action for it. So we looked at our maps. You know, our, our commissioner is, is, is uh, really devoted to the issue of, of you know, health disparities. And, and, you know, and we apply that lens to everything we do. But we did that immediately and immediately started sending people out to local providers in those communities to drop off information, to get our advertising, to go to subway stops. And we actually had staff going to some of the larger public hospitals in those areas to basically get providers on board. And we saw very rapidly that those testing rates went up. So but there were additional challenges, right? The, yep. the, the mm -hmm. testing wasn't widely available. Mm -hmm. um, the testing wasn't particularly accurate even now. We're not mm -hmm. sure there's false positives if you've had dengue, if you had yellow mm -hmm. fever, if you had a previous injection with a, a vaccination with ye against yellow fever. Uh, and then there were, in your defense, um, there was an important piece of information you didn't know at the beginning of this, which was mm -hmm. that it's sexually transmitted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, be, so you had the first mosquito-borne virus ever known to cause a birth defect and the first mosquito-borne virus ever known to be sexually transmitted. So those people who were trans traveling and coming back to New York and it's in the bloodstream for an average of about a week, I'm a 50-year-old man, you're telling me it's, uh, it's not a big deal. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is if a mosquito, mm -hmm. an 80s Egyptian mosquito bites you and then turns around and bites a pregnant woman, wherever, where, if they happen to be in an area where, where you have the 80s. So I think, I think it was very challenging. It's a, a moving target where every week there seemed to be a new discovery. Right, and that moving target, right, and the ability to have a consistent message, you think about like a you know, baseline of communications, right? Consistency of message counts, and the ability to have that um, helps build credibility. And the problem was the science is moving so fast um, that the communications coming out, um, trying to stay up with it, and, and there was times that the message was conflicting, um, which leads to a credibility problem, which leads to an audience problem of do I need to listen, when do I need to listen, and what do I need to listen to? And I feel that the, the Zika kind of endless flow of communication, and whether it was the informing that you were getting on some good, credible channels, um, the warning that you were getting from some less credible channels, and then the just overall business of media. I need content up there to get eyeballs on, on my page, um, and I'll fill it with 
human stories, mm -hmm. science stories, any story. All um, right, all Zika all the time. And I feel that that led to a lot of paralysis on a lot of audiences uh, to not know what do I act on now. I wondered whether there was the double whammy of having a bowl in 2014, which uh. obviously was overblown hugely in the United States. We always said, they actually counted up on the CBS This Morning folks are at the table. We actually counted up how many times I was on um, you know, Face the Nation, CBS This Morning, mm -hmm. Evening News. It was 66 times. That was the number. And every time it was the same message. You know, it's a real problem in West Africa, but it's really magical thinking to think it can widely spread the United States over and over and over again. So now, and of course, we did, you know, it was already the biggest epidemic ever in June, but we didn't do anything until two Americans got infected at the end of July. Now, a couple of years go by, and you have the Zika virus come. And I think, I was just down in Puerto Rico, mm. and speaking to people, you know, cab drivers, other people, they're like, what's Zika? There's no problem. And it reminds me of like, you know, in the movies, when, you watch, when you're watching a scary moment, we're all so smart. We know it's a scary moment. Why? Because the music changes, and there's a close-up. Mm -hmm. so, really, yeah. I think something scary is about to happen. But in life, you know, there's no music change. There's no close-up. You have to control the zoom yourself. You have to have the soundtrack in your head. And I think it's very hard when you have a silent epidemic that's happening to, yes, the babies were, her, it was horrific to see uh -huh. them, but it was over there, just mm -hmm. like Ebola was happening over there. And now, of course, we hear it's going to be in Puerto Rico and 25% of the island's going to be in, at least, because to go after mm -hmm. chikungunya, but chikungunya wasn't sexually transmitted, maybe it's going to be more than 25% by the end of the year. And then we hear about it coming in, in, into Miami, and it's sort of, it's still invisible, there's no soundtrack, and it's an amazing disconnect, because after all, as reflected, well, maybe there were other factors in the fact that Congress was requested, you know, for $1.9 billion in February, and they immediately went into action, and seven months later, you know, approved <laughs> funding. And, you know, people, you have people like Tom Frieden, who, you know, Tom is not a jumping up and got down guy yeah. in terms of, he's generally common, he's saying, this is no way to run an epidemic. You know, hmm. what is going on? So. Well, I think, so we talked a little bit about Ebola versus Zika. For me, I think you have this problem of delay. And there's a couple places it comes into place where with Ebola, it's an immediate infection. You are dramatically infected. You need to be put into isolation. It's, it's instant, right? With Zika, it's not a dramatic infection. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you won't really know if you impacted your pregnancy for nine months. And you might not know for many, many years because we just don't know how affected the brain is. And I think that's really an additional challenge with this one and why you're having that disconnect with people. But I don't know if you agree. Yeah, no, I mean, we, I think the issue of fear came up before, you know, uh, repeatedly and, and how you use fear. I mean, for us, again, the, the continuing ongoing concern for us is uh, people at risk, women of reproductive age and their male partners um, traveling when they shouldn't be traveling, or if they do travel, making sure that they use precautions both when they travel and on their return. And uh, we were struggling, and we continue to struggle with ways of getting that message out. You know, for a lot of people who have close ties to those communities, they say, my family members live there. Why, why am I special? Why should I not go there? If they're, if they're able to live there, I should go there. And so we used, when we had, we've only had one, thankfully so far, uh, case of uh, confirmed birth defect in, uh, that was associated with, my, with, with Zika. Uh, it probably won't be the first. It won't be the only one, but it's the only one we've, we've confirmed so far. Um, we made a point of having a, a, a media event about that. We mm -hmm. you know, stripped it entirely of any identifying information, which infuriated everybody in the media. <laughs> people like me. But we needed that to draw attention to people. because yeah. we, And we were trying to draw attention to the people that, that need to get that information. Mm -hmm. um, when we needed to sort of humanize it in some way. And that's exactly right, because there is this 80% of people are asymptomatic, and then only some proportion of people who are infected will be women who will have a birth defect. But mm -hmm. do you think there's some degree of desensitization so that yep. we, they said, oh, you know, you, you faked this out two years ago with Ebola. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a problem with West Africa, but it never really was a big problem here, and yet you were on TV every single day. So now, you know, yes, you're saying it's a big problem again, but are we really going to believe you? And I remember thinking, you know, when, when, uh, when bird flu came out, um, hmm. I think I wrote a blog. I wrote, don't you let people quote themselves? But it was basically, the, yeah. I like the title. The title was Bird Flu Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And, uh, and, but, I, but I started with sort of like, you know, um, you know, bird flu, SARS, MERS, you know, I reeled off a bunch of, you know, I'm, I find myself yearning back, longing for the days when I was a 10-year-old 
And all I had to worry about was total nuclear annihilation. <laughs> exactly. uh, but you think this business of, you know, <laughs> and, you know it's one thing after another yeah. after that. And by the way, we know after Zika, there are already, there will be, we already have a couple of candidates. Well, there's, there was conversation, you know, um, last week in a, in a talk around Zika at, at Harvard um, of just fatigue, yeah. uh, kind of panic fatigue and emergency fatigue yeah. overall. Yeah. And that, you know, when you look at the funding issue, whether it was politicized or not, we can have a whole other discussion on that. But I think, you know, one of the, one of the points that was raised is that there's just, there was a lot of fatigue of the government at the time of, there was a emergency after emergency after emergency. And, and, and funds were just getting pulled from all kinds of places. But I think the same thing exists, obviously, with, with these, these types of conditions. And how, how many different types of panics can we go through from a medical standpoint and from a media standpoint? Um, I feel sorry for, for, the, for the reporters that I work with who have to, who have to report on, on things that are coming out because big governing bodies like the CDC and WHO are putting missives out and there's no choice. You have to report on them. You can't just look at them and like, maybe. Um, you've, got to, you've got to put it out there and that just creates more and more churn. When you look at the government response, I think Tom Frieden and, and Tony Fauci are totally on the right track with this emergency response fund, infectious disease response fund they're talking about, so, like FEMA. So that it's, this, it's there. You, you have uh -huh. a couple of billion or whatever mm -hmm. in that fund because what was it that Tom said to me? The, um, the speed with which an epidemic moves and the speed with which Congress moves <laughs> are totally different, different rates. So yeah. I love that idea and I think that they're probably gonna be uh, doing that. Well, and Todd, you compared Ebola and Zika. You were sort of following both really, really closely. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, you to talk a little bit about what you did and what you saw and sort of how you think about it now. Because with Ebola, you know, we, well, you, you explain. Well, so, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think of what, you know, what we did as communicators and how we worked with our companies and how we worked with clients ar around the condition and what we were hearing from them. And there was a lot of fear um, uh, among our clients about how do they communicate with their employees and what do they tell them to do and where do they point them, what information sh should, they, should, they, should they take away. And so, as a firm that spends a lot of time thinking about you know, preparedness and, and communication preparedness, um, you know, we pulled together um, some experts and, and got a, a call together where we could walk multitudes of, of companies through how to communicate with their audiences. Hmm. And they really took it to heart. We've had, we produced a number of documents that companies used as real blueprints about how they could communicate credible information from credible sources. It wasn't us. You know, I'm not a physician and I don't work with many physicians at, at Edelman, there are a few. Um, but the ability to help big business be part of the channel of communication is something that I think is, is often missing yeah. when we start talking about public health issues. Because whether you're in New York or whether you're in Miami or, or other parts of, of the world, the employers have this essentially somewhat of a parental role to play uh, in the community and they, and they are looked to as a source of information. And with Ebola, we actually got our arms around that quickly and had a lot of business partners who could help us communicate that information. Um, Zika comes along, February, my chief operations officer turns to me and says, Todd, I want you to like take the mantle of following Zika. You're gonna communicate weekly to our global network, follow it, what's going on? So we started to, you know, Reskin the Ebola stuff out and like you know replace Zika you know put it in there find and replace yeah. find and replace um, yeah and and what was really remarkable was the utter lack of response and interest oh yeah um, and we have clients in tourism that clearly are being impact, in, uh, impacted we have clients who are going to the uh, to the Olympics who are clearly have the opportunity for impact. And there was, I think, this, like, as I said before, this general paralysis of we don't know what to tell them. Um, we don't know what to communicate and we don't know where to send them. And, and you think about companies like ours, companies like you know, some of our clients, uh, like a PwC that have partners flying all over the world of having like, what are their policies to help communicate to their employees about the risk? Very different, they, were, they jumped right on it with Ebola with Zika, it was a real, like, we didn't get that level of response. And I think some of it is, back to your point, mm -hmm. Ebola is instant, it's deadly, it's dramatic. 
Um, Zika is a, you know, it's a mosquito. I'll see it coming, I'll kill it myself. Um, so uh, I, I think that the, the marked difference that, you know, even if you look at the press coverage, the volume of coverage on Zika out number the Ebola coverage probably like 10 to one. Um, but the response from uh, the various places where we thought we'd get more response didn't happen. And I found that striking from a communications professional. Hmm. Dr. Verma, what do you think the next year looks like from you? Because I feel like I was around for West Nile. You know, I saw how that got all the attention and we like barely hear about that now. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate that there will come a time where it becomes part of the ether and uh, it's not as big of a concern. What do you think the next year or five years look like? So related to Zika, you mean, right? Yeah. Okay. So again, we, unfortunately, this is again where the uncertainty is, and, and what we're focused on right now is really what's going to happen over the next couple of months um, in the southern hemisphere um, as we enter winter and they enter summer. This is where we'll get a sense. Chikungunya behaved one way, dengue behaves another. With chikungunya, there was a wave of infection that spread through. Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, that first year of that epidemic, we had over 600 cases in New York City. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get anybody to write a story about it, but we had over 600 cases of imported cases of chicken. It's too hard to spell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it sounds too. Although you would think that gay, I can spell. The weird yeah. name might you know excite people, but it didn't. Um, there wasn't a Z in it, I guess. Um, but do you think that's a problem that you couldn't get us to tell the story? Yeah, I well, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it isn't. You know, we we didn't really fear local transmission. We didn't fear long-term consequences. So for us, this was a you know, relatively low probability event, a relatively low health consequence event. So for us, we didn't feel like we needed to prioritize about it. Um, and then in subsequent years, we've had fewer than, you know, 100 imported cases. So our, our best guess is that this will behave similarly just because immunity tends to be durable. There, with the assumption is that immunity will last a long time and that uh, there was enough widespread transmission. But we don't really know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what I suspect will ultimately happen, though, because the consequences of infection are so grave that uh, that it will would not surprise me if Zika becomes like a rubella, which is you know you test every woman who's pregnant for their immunity to it, um, and then ultimately when a vaccine becomes available, becomes something that's more uh, widely available. I just think because the consequences for women are so grave that that's probably inevitable. But yeah. we don't know. I think we're going to have to see how how it spreads. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this fine line of fear, because. Um, I still remember those slides that we saw from the CDC talking about the flu. I don't know if other people in the room remember it, but it was you know a marketing thing from the C uh, someone in the CDC who put together slides like, here's how we sell the flu vaccine. It's through fear. And it really got people angry mm -hmm. to hear that. And I think that the woman from the BBC had a really interesting point. Um, how do you see sort of fear and like managing people's fear while at the same time motivating them. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the dis distinction was drawn before is very important, which is that we're not, we never try in the business of generating fear, but if the public is already fearful for whatever reason, um, we need to use that attention to be channeled into mm -hmm. interventions where they have control over them. Um, and that is just absolutely essential. You know, so we in public health, we think, okay, what is the likelihood of an event occurring? What are the consequences if it occurs? And we try to make our analyses based on that. But the reality is there's this third factor, which is all these other emotions that play into that. Um, is this familiar to me? Um, is it something that I have control over? Um, do I trust the people that are getting me information? So when we're in this crisis communications mode, we have to be focused on all of those emotions factors because um, it's not the logic that get, logic gets people to think, you know, facts get people to think, but it's the emotions that'll get people to act. So, so we really need, when we're in a set, setting where people may be fearful, because my colleagues here are generating it, <laughs> that, that we need to say, well, here's something, here's, something you, here's something you can do. You know, you can use mosquito repellent. You can call 311 to, to get your standing water complaints addressed. So just so people know, you know, mosquitoes, you know, love water that sits there. And so, you know, within the first two months of our advertising campaign uh, that started in April to get people aware about Zika threat and local mosquito threat, we had already exceeded the entire year of before of complaints to our 311 line for there is a pool that nobody's cleaned up, there is water somewhere that we need to address. So we were trying to give people something to do. So I, I do think that fear can be useful if it's you're giving people something to do with it. If, you, if all you're telling them is to be fearful, then obviously that's the last thing you want. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's a funny thing about being a physician and a journalist. I mean, the, to me, my, my mantra is 
the Hippocratic Oath always trumps the Nielsen ratings. Yeah. So, yes, <laughs> it might be interesting to see a fire and, oh, bring some people over that fire. We'll just watch it for a while. And, oh, it's getting out of control. So my instinct is I can't, I don't like fear. The 66 times I was on, every time it was mm -hmm. to bring the fear down, to explain the facts. Uh, Rand Morrison, who, who was the executive producer of Sunday Morning, asked, did the unprecedented thing of actually having it the, at the height of the problem in New York City when, uh, with Dr. Spencer, right? Um, uh -huh. He said, I want you to do a straight to the camera spiel about Zika, you know, you know what the facts are, and which, which like he said, it, they had never done before. Huh. So that's my, that, that, my instinct is to get rid of the theory, and I, th I think you're playing with fire if you, if you try to uh, use it and you know we'll have a safe burn here and you know but i do want to say because julie mentioned about how um uh you know misinformation at the beginning we've got it when we really don't have it is such a problem and i think the a real turning point with ebola was when it was an amber joy vincent the nurse who flew for, uh, to ohio on the plane and she calls up the cdc and says I have a fear. I think I have a low-grade fever. I was working with somebody with Ebola. It's 99.5, and the person looks at a chart and says, "Well, it's not 100.4. You don't have a fever." She calls again. And she says, "Well, no, no. I, I'm like I'm feeling a little warm. What? 99.5? Not a fever." And she flies. And that was this moment where, like before then, you know, it's hard to understand. But that was a real common sense moment that America sort of went like this. And Tony Fauci, bless him, you know, in an interview that I had with him, he said, "Look, somebody dropped the ball." You know, mm. that was a wonderful moment because it was like, if you're saying there's no problem, I'm really worried. Then I got to like, you know, I got to try to handle this myself somehow. If you're saying somebody dropped the, you know, we're on a learning curve, protocols were wrong, somebody dropped the ball, we got it now. It's Tony Fauci. It's the CDC. It's Tom Frieden. I'm fine. I'm cool. I'm back. But, you know, I think that's so important when things aren't going exactly perfectly to acknowledge it. Because, yeah. you know, the truth shall set you free. So. I got a little different look on it because I don't, I don't put words in Bob's mouth because I don't think what Bob was saying was to use fear. Um, what, he, no. what I heard him say is that when there's fear, people pay attention. And, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at the communications environment and trying to figure out when people pay attention and how you get them to pay attention. And in today's environment, hyper fragmented, no time, content galore, more than you could ever possibly consume. But I think it represents this opportunity that I think the public health and, and, and communicators can think about that in these moments when you do have fear and people are paying attention, that we give very specific thought to the audiences. And you, you've brought it up before, but the audiences and what you want them to do when you get the communication to them. And I think one area where public health can evolve in its communications is really starting to fragment that audience and use the different channels in different ways. Because right now we try to like, let's establish the facts first, communicate as much as we can broadly, and that's when you have this kind of carpet bombing effect of information. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we have enough um, channel segmentation to make sure that we're really getting the right message into the right people. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about when I saw this daunting topic, because I was like, what the hell do I know about city preparedness? Um, but the idea of cultural sensitivity, and I know, you know some, of the, some of the clients I'm working with have been working very hard with local physicians about helping them understand, you know, uh, just the simple, like how various communities use home remedies and how those home remedies might interact with uh, RX remedies and those types of things. So when you extrapolate that out and start thinking about these type of, of, of issues hitting various cultures, um, being digested and feared and understood and prevented and cared about in very different ways, and that cultural competency along with um, channel competency and message um, segmentation is all part of the more of the complexity that we have to face in today's environment. Uh, and I think that that does require, I think, w with our public health officials and friends, CDC and others, that there needs to be some, some evolution of, of how we get messages out, not just hit the big button and go right through the mass media. Yeah, I mean, I would say one other audience that we haven't talked about is elected officials. You know, we've yeah. been talking broadly about, okay, how do we educate the public? Well, the reality is our elected officials whether, you know, they're representative governments, you know, they may not represent all of our views, but they're cons major consumers of this information. And, and that's what we oftentimes have to react to. And Ebola was a, a perfect example of where, 
you know, we really had to work with our, you know, newly elected, uh, you know, mayor and their and their people and and all the staff that worked there to really make sure they understood that doing what's right based on science is actually good policy and being consistent will help you because there's a lot of tendency to to want to just okay, well, let's if we do more, that'll be good. Um, when there are many situations in which doing more, if it's contradictory to the scientific information, people pick up on that. And I think one of the challenges, they get a lot of inquiries, a lot of questions about, well, is this possible? And we keep trying to shift them to, and we like to shift the media as much as possible to focus on not what's possible, what's probable. And, and when you focus on that and you handle that, you're generally you're doing the right thing. Well, and the you're politics has consequences. I mean, we're looking right now at um, in Florida, the sort of dispute between the CDC and the local public health officials, mm. that has a real effect on people on the ground. Mm -hmm. So, And in the press. And in the press, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have one more question for you guys. Dr. Gerberding um, mentioned lessons learned the hard way, and all I wanted to know was what, which lessons those were. So I'm gonna ask each of you, <laughs> if you wanna share something where you have a lesson learned the hard way that might inform the next time there is a public health crisis, um, how we move forward. Well, I think I gave you one about Zika, but right. I, again, I'm not sure how we would change that. You know, we couldn't have predicted how we were really concerned that New Yorkers would be concerned and that they would want to make sure that they were seeing proactive government. I would say the one other example is, I know you guys did a story with me about, a, we had a large outbreak in uh, New York City last year of Legionnaire's disease, which is um, a type of pneumonia, um, and it was due to something called a cooling tower, which is an engineering structure that sits on top of buildings and can occasionally contaminate and spray and, and damage a community. And one of the, the lessons that was learned, and actually our mayor, de Blasio, is the one that uh, sort of taught this to us at the end of all this, after this is a very big problem, and there's a lot of issues that we learned. But one was like, why didn't we just call it an outbreak of pneumonia? You know, what was really scaring people, I mean, some of it was their lack of control, but some of it was that it had this exotic name. You could, you know, I, I had trouble spelling it. I kept having to worry how many N's are there. Do you put an S apostrophe or apostrophe? I mean, it's a scary name, and so had we, <laughs> thought about this very early on that you know we want to give people information they can use but if we would really just said it was an outbreak of pneumonia <laughs> it would have been more familiar and we yeah. could have addressed it more without generating a lot of panic and I do think honestly something as simple as picking the right name for something you know or at least how we in public health refer to it all the time actually has a much bigger impact than we realize you know you worried about the, the apostrophes if you had treated it parenthetically yes. it would have been a lot yes. easier pneumonia parentheses <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> Yeah, great. <laughs> Can I go back to my strunk and white? <laughs> Do either of you have something you want to share? Um, you know, I'll take one that's, and it's not a, um, it's not a public health, you know, health health one, but something that we learned in Orlando. Uh, Edelman, uh, we started to work with the, with the government, when the mayor down there after the nightclub shootings and uh, started to see how the community was responding. And one of the things that happened as we were, looking for assistance from businesses. And we wound up getting a donation of like 100,000 wool blankets, which was not what was needed for people in Miami. Um, so the ability, so when, <laughs> so when you start to think about when you're, when you're going out and, and, and you have these situations where there's opportunities for other parties to help, mm. guiding them on what to help, what they can do to help, is an important part of the communication, not just that we need help, but tell them what to do. If we needed blood, we told them we needed blood. You know, if we needed, you know, shelter, we told them where we needed that stuff. So I think, you know, I think we were anxious to get the message out that, that help was needed. We needed to guide that a little bit better so that um, when, when people showed up with help, it was useful. Yeah. 